Equality is a four letter word. I mean, don't look at the way it's spelled. It is a four letter word. It is a dirty word from the waterless pit of hell. Peace to you, my friends, in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Equality, guys. Equality is a four letter word. I mean, don't look at the way it's spelled. It is a four letter word. It is a dirty word from the waterless pit of hell. To pursue equality is to pursue imprisonment. It's as Christian as a Catholic Democrat promoting abortion or or homosexual pedophilia or or neo-Marxist racism. That's how Christian the pursuit of equality is. Equality is what the devil used to tempt Adam and Eve into sin in the Garden of Eden. It's a dirty, dirty word and an even worse desire to nurture in our hearts as if it's some sort of virtue, let alone the end-all, be-all of virtues. It's the source of all the hateful, disenfranchised, woe-is-me victimization that has swept over this country, over the Western world, in the last, what, 70, 80 years? It's destroying our society and the lives of our neighbors, this wonderful pursuit of equality. The devil has led us onto his escalator of equality, where everybody wants to be where someone else is, just like Adam and Eve, trying to grasp equality with God, thinking that was something that could be had. And if you stand back and look, you'll notice the sadness of all of it. You'll see how dirty this word is, because when you get off of the escalator, when you actually take a step back and look at it, you finally notice something. You finally notice that the devil did promise you an escalator ride. Yeah, yeah, he did. But it's not going up as you assumed. It's actually going down. For example, in the pursuit of equality with white men, men of darker complexions are tempted to throw off their own integrity, their own strength of character, and to claim victimhood, to be victims of systemic racism. And so they don't grow stronger as persons. No, they grow weaker, developing a spirit of defeat, locking themselves into a a mental and emotional prison of their own making that keeps them down, just as the powers that be would, would have it be. Another example, in the pursuit of equality with all men, women, they throw off their unique identity and they claim to be victims of the patriarchy, yeah? Despising not so much masculinity, that's what you would think, but no, no, no. They despise their femininity as they strive to be just like the very men they hate so much. And so they they don't actually grow stronger as women. No, they grow weaker. Their own cry of inequality moves them from the freedom of womanhood that was given to them by God and into a self-made prison that serves to keep them locked far away from being truly women. Another example would be men who in the pursuit of equality, seeing this economy of victimization being played out, wanting to be equal with women, then throw off their masculinity and claim to be victims of society's gender conformity. Yeah? Not growing stronger as men, no. Weaker. Weaker as as their own cry of victimization leads them into a pursuit of womanhood in, in homosexual effeminacy and therefore locks them locks them into a prison of their own design where where they're only, only ever moving incrementally farther and farther away from equality with their brothers. See, guys, treating equality as this great good, this good thing of the Western world, it's, it's actually led to, another example, millions of babies being murdered by their moms who want to be, who've been taught to be, to pursue equality with men in their ability to be free from the natural consequences of sex. If we weren't, as a society, as a people, driven to pursue equality as if it was the highest good, well, then women could be empowered to shut down every sleazeball who who tried to get into their pants recognizing that the reality is that the playboy, yeah, he bears none 
of the immediate post-sex responsibility. And it behooves her to shut him down. And then bada bing, bada boom, we just solved almost all of Western man's problems. We've solved the fatherlessness problem. We've solved the abortion problem, the welfare problem, the mass shooter problem, the drug abuse problem, the homelessness problem, the LGBTQ problem. I mean, just about every one of our society ills can be traced back to this pursuit of equality, especially between men and women. In this country, in the Western world even, they all flow out of the destruction of the family that has occurred in the name of equality. There are other examples too, but these ones are suffice to prove the point. Guys, when you consider the cross, when you can consider Jesus on the cross, what do you see? Do you, do you see a picture of a person pursuing equality? No. Do you see someone labeling himself a victim to be made equal with others? Is that what Jesus is doing on the cross? No, not at all. What do we see? Well, we see, well, actually we see a couple things, but we see exactly where the devil got his equality escalator scheme. That's for sure. We see that. Remember, the devil isn't that creative. In fact, he's not creative at all. He can't create a single thing. He can only twist the truth. And so he looks at the cross and he sees the reality. He sees what God does to save us. And he's twisted that to use us to go away from God, to come away, to be drawn away from God. See, the suggestion of equality, it tempts us to pursue to move higher. It tempts us to do something better, to, to pursue a better something, whatever that something is. But the actual pursuit of equality, it's taking people lower, where they're imprisoned, where they, they give up hope. And yes, indeed, they lose faith in God. And you know, I mean, you do know this, right? That what's behind all the DEI lies today, it's, it's all in pursuit of, or or the goal is to get people to lose you, to lose hope in God. The devil doesn't care about making racists. I know, he doesn't. He doesn't care about feminists, making feminists, or or gay men, or trans black men, or, or suicide rates going up. He doesn't care about any of this kind of stuff. No, he doesn't care about turning moms into murderers, or or convincing boys to chop off their genitals, and, and girls to chop off their breasts, or anything. He doesn't care about any of this stuff. The devil doesn't care about that. Those are his tools to move people farther and farther away from God. They're the means, not the end. They serve to imprison individuals in their despair so that they lose hope in Christ the King and, and resign themselves, therefore, to living in Satan's waterless pit, to, to living in hell with, with the enemy. And yes, he got his idea from Christ's cross. How so? Well, look at what's going on there. Jesus isn't crying victim, but he is a victim. He's truly innocent, not deserving to be murdered. No, he didn't deserve to be crucified. We do. That's what we deserve. But he isn't crying victim. No, sir. Why not? Because, as Philippians 2 tells us, he wasn't pursuing equality. No. In sin, we get on the escalator thinking it's going up when in reality it's going down down. But Jesus, no, Jesus knew he needed to go down so that he could raise us up. The cross, the cross is Christ's escalator. It looks like one thing, but is in fact something else altogether. It looks like defeat when it is in fact victory. It looks like death when it is in fact life, your life, eternal life. Jesus looks like a criminal, but he is, in fact, truly our king. So look at the cross, friends. Always keep the cross before your minds. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble, the prophet Zechariah says. Now call to mind what Paul wrote about our king in Philippians. As he was telling the Philippian church about Jesus, giving them instructions how to live as Christians. Our epistle reading this morning, it's chapter 2, starting at verse 5. But I'm going to read from verse 3 for some context. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, 
but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Dear saints, dear Christian, Jesus went low and was raised up. He went so low as to die and be buried in the earth. He was the lowest of lowly servants. He was, in fact, you could say, our very own cinder fella. And no, no, not in some transgender way. Uh-uh, get that junk out of your brain. That's Satan's cheap plagiarism. No, Cinderella's name actually comes from her servant identity. Do you know this? She was the one who swept the fireplace, all covered in ash and soot, the cinders of the hearth, Cinderella. Though she was the father's actual child, she was made lower than her stepsisters. But how does the story go? Even the pre-woke Disney version, which is watered down from the Grimm's fairy tale version, how does it go? She's exalted in the end, isn't she? She's made royalty in the end. That story, friends, has stood the test of time because it is transcendent. It is the transcendent story of Jesus Christ who, though he was in the form of God, was the Father's true child, his true son. He didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, did he? No. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, we read, right? Humble, obedient, obedient to the law, even to the point of death. As in the beginning of Lent, Ash Wednesday, right? Ashes to ashes, Cinderella, death. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Philippians 2.9. And we do, don't we? Joyfully we do. We look to the cross and see our king righteous and having salvation is he humble. We see the escalator that will actually take us higher by going lower, that will deliver us from our fallen sinfulness. We see the humble one who cut off the chariot and the war horse and the battle bow. That is, we see the one who ended our war with God and is our peace treaty with our neighbors. Be they of a different ethnicity or sex or, or be they wrestling with different sins. It doesn't matter. We're all sinners. We're all in need of Jesus Christ. We bow our knees to Jesus, not seeking that four-letter dirty word, equality. No, but repenting of such pride, recognizing that we have been on an escalator to hell, but Jesus has rescued us. That our King, Jesus Christ, came and he speaks peace to the nations. He rules from sea to sea to the ends of the earth. So we bow the knee, no longer trying to, to go up, but willfully wanting to go down, down to our knees as low as we possibly can before the God of our salvation, praying humbly, knowing that in our sin, in our confession, we truly deserve the waterless pit, but that our King, our King who only ever deserves to be glorified and exalted, our King came down to where we are and established by his blood a new covenant with us, setting us free from our prison to sin and free from our pursuit of all that hurts us, all that looks shiny and good. He's returned us to our stronghold, making us prisoners. Yeah, sure, we're still prisoners, but not of despair, not of our own miserable making, no. 
not of victimization, not of sin, but prisoners of hope. Oh, prisoners of hope. Hope in our King. That's right. Jesus Christ, the crucified one who restores us double through his death and resurrection. Not just to life, but eternal life. Praise be to the Son of God, our Lord and our King. Amen. And amen. Guys, I hope this sermon was a blessing to you and yours, whomever you decide to share this with. And if you want to listen to more sermons, here's the playlist down here right there. If you want to see what my initial thoughts were on the texts for this sermon, you can take a look at this video right here from this last Tuesday. Every Tuesday at 10 a.m., I live stream right here on the YouTube channel that my initial thoughts of the year about these texts as we approach them. So take a look at this sermon's initial thoughts right there, and we'll see you in the next video.